Thanks everyone for coming out tonight to tonight's um, topic. I'm gonna be sharing with you a little bit of what my experience was with putting together my book, but uh, in general, I'll be giving you some ideas about how to go about um, searching for your Tejano genealogy. Now, um, a lot of what I'll talk about tonight doesn't necessarily have to do, uh, I mean, it's not only about Tejanos, it, it applies to anybody that wants to learn about their culture and history. Um, so um, I just want you to keep that in mind as we go through it. But I happen to be of Hispanic or Tejano uh, cultural heritage, hence the title and the emphasis on Tejano history in particular, okay? So if you're wondering, what is a Tejano? Well, Tejano is Spanish for Texan. And Tejanos are a uh, subculture in the Hispanic culture of uh, a mixture of ancestries. And their ancestral mix has to do with Native Americans, uh, Spaniards and Mexicans, or a combination of those things, who happen to have um, settled in Texas as we know it today. Now, in my opinion, their history is important because we've been here for a very long time. And um, it's uh, kind of sad to me that, in my uh, point of view, it might be a little bit marginalized when it comes to American history in general. But it, I do think it's important because um, we haven't only survived all different forms of government here, we've thrived and we've lived under various flags and, and governments over time. So we've kind of witnessed a little bit of everything our ancestry has. And so um, if you ask me, to me, to, the Tejano culture is a part of the very heart and soul of Texas as we know it. And a lot of people from out of state will visit the state of Texas. And if they happen to be in the DFW area, many times they'll visit um, the stockyards in Fort Worth because they get a, a, a little flair of that old west um, mythology, or what, if you will. And that, and, and, and that applies to the whole Southwest, but in all parts of the Southwest, the Tejanos well, or Californios or what have you, the Hispanics, were very much a part of that uh, uh, time, time period. And you can't watch a Western movie without some Hispanics in the background somewhere, because we've been around. So when I put my book together, I will just give you a little brief introduction of uh, how things happen for me. All genealogists, um, are looking for vital statistics about their family. They want to know names and plates, uh, pardon me, names and places of, of birth, um, names and places of, of death, marriage, and so forth. And these are known as vital statistics that any genealogist is looking for. As I went through my journey of getting my Tejano ancestry, as I researched different people, I just thought, wouldn't it be nice to put together little stories, even if just one or two stories about individuals, wherever it was possible, so that I could uh, commemorate their memories in a more uh, meaningful way, as opposed to just being black and white information on a page. And also, when I finally got to the point where I had, well, I had a lot of information here, maybe I should put this in a book form or something for any ancestors out there that may have wanted to uh, know about this knowledge as well. And so that's basically how uh, my project came together. I'm not a professional writer or anything, but it was, it was a lot of work. I thought maybe I should do this, and that's how my book, The Hano Experience, came to be in the first place. So metaphorically speaking, if you would like to cook up a history about your own family and your ancestry, there's really two main ingredients that need to be uh, utilized. And the first ingredient is what I just mentioned, and that is vital statistics. And again, most genealogists uh, have, that have done this for some time have quite a bit of that. But the other important ingredient, in my opinion, is to learn about the history uh, of the uh, region and the time period that your ancestors lived in. And even if you didn't know these folks, which obviously you could not have known them, they've passed away long since. If you know about the time periods they lived in, the region they lived in, you can learn about what was happening around them. And in that way, you can actually write a story that, that surrounds them and the things they might have gone through. But it does take time. None of this is done overnight, y'all. This takes time to learn about history and also about the ancestry information that you're seeking. So just keep that in mind. Now, we'll talk about that first ingredient a little bit. And I just want to share, again, in my experience, I believe that I first became sort of interested in genealogy when I was just a kid. We used to uh, frequently visit the ranches of my, my mother's maternal cousins in deep south Texas. And we used to work there in summers. Uh, we visited frequently, and it was a hub of family activity. And it always seems like every time we went to visit, I was meeting numerous second cousins that I never knew existed. These were huge families. Most ranch families were pretty huge, and ours was no exception. And so I was just always intrigued by how many cousins I would meet, and I would always grow my parents. 
how am I related to these cousins? What's the connection or, or what have you? It was just real interesting to me. And then of course, when I was in high school, um, we had to do a project for uh, genealogy. And I think that's a part of American history. If I'm, some of the teachers might correct me on that, but it, it's a great project for people to try to get to know their own history and cultural, uh, uh, about their culture and history. And so those were the seeds that were probably planted before I really started getting serious about it, but I was always interested in it. So I'll be talking about um, four major sources, uh, if you're Tejano, for genealogy, genealogy information that you're gonna need to put your story together. And I would say that the very most important ingredient of all is your own family. And um, I would start uh, with grandparents or even great grandparents if you have them, if you're lucky enough to have them. I only had one grandparent that I was able to know because she lived to a pretty uh, uh, old age. But the rest I really didn't know. So that was one reason I was very interested in the family at some point. Well, where do I come from and how did I get here? And so if you have grandparents, they're a, um, a wonderful source of information for the family. If you ask them information, you wanna ask them, where are they from? Where did they grow up? Uh, how much schooling did they have? Where did they go to school? Uh, did they have, what did they do for a living when they got older? And if your grandparents can tell you about their grandparents, uh, same information, you're already at your great, great grandparents level. And in many cases, you're talking about 200 years ago. So if your grandparents are alive, you really wanna talk to them if they're not alive and they happen to have siblings that are alive, they're a great source of information too because they're about the same age and after all, they're from the same lineage and you might ask them about information. Uh, and I'll tell you, anytime I've spoke with um, elders in the family that, that were not my grandparents, um, they were always happy to talk about the good old days. They enjoyed it, especially in this day and age where we've kind of become a little impersonal with the way we communicate with texting and you know online and whatnot. Um, but they're from old school. They're used to engaging in conversations with people when they want to commute with someone, communicate with someone. So anyway, um, you'd be surprised how much they've got to tell you. And, and, and you're, you're going to find, I don't have enough time to get all this information. But they have a lot of information they can share with you. Aunts and uncles shouldn't be um, excluded. They're extended family, cousins are extended family. And I have found in my research over time that there are uh, at least one or two people in a nuclear or uh, extended family that are very gung-ho about family tree information. And uh, they'll be more than happy to share information because somebody's interested in this besides me, you know, and the, they will be happy to give you, and it's usually a gold mine of information. And if you don't know who these, if you don't know them personally, but you know that you're related to them, make an effort, don't be shy, please uh, get in contact with them. And again, you'll get a lot of information from those folks. Um, there's friends of the family you could ask. Maybe you come from a neighborhood where your house was inherited by your parents from their, uh, from your grandparents, and there may be neighbors. Hopefully there were good neighbors that you got along with, they got along with. And a lot of times they'll have information about your family that, from a different perspective, and um, that's a great way to get information as well. The most important thing about talking to family members, I think, is you've got to write this information down. You've got to um, record it in written uh, form because you will find that the more that you talk to them, the more information you're gonna get from them, the harder it is to remember all that stuff because it's a wealth of information. So it really is important to write this stuff down. It's not enough to just hear the story and just, oh, because you'll forget later if you don't write it down. And you also wanna be as organized as possible with your information. I think it's important when you gather information from the family that you obviously write who they were and um, notate how you're related to them, what connection you have, what form of communication did you use, did you have a, a, a verbal conversation, uh, did you get information from a letter that was passed down through the family as an heirloom or, or you know a memoir. Any way you got that information, you want to make a note of it. And you also want to date when you got it because if you ever get to a point where you're going to put everything together, uh, as a family story, these are used as citations to substantiate what you're talking about. It's not something you made up in your head. Um, you're giving it credibility by citing other people that knew because they were there. And the other thing I would do is try to make a file of each individual that you're researching as you go, which is not how I did it. So I'm, I'm trying to help you out, save a little time. I, I would collect information from here and there, and everything would be in a clutter in a box somewhere, and, and um, end up in the bottom of a closet or in the attic. 
But when I got down to putting everything together, it was like putting the pieces of a puzzle together because there was so much information from everywhere. So I would, again, emphasize organizing this info uh, with, with one file per person. It's worth the investment, you know. And by the time you get around to writing your story, it's going to be much easier to put it together and it won't be as time consuming as it was for me. Now, if you're Hispanic in Tejano, which is what we're emphasizing tonight, you're in a lot of luck if you want to do genealogy. And I say that um, in large part thanks to two religious world organizations that we know. One is the Roman Catholic Church, and the other is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, also known as the Mormons or the LDS. Now, the Roman Catholic Church um, was very much involved during the colonization of the Americas by the Spaniards. And in fact, Columbus, who was Italian, was flying under the Spanish flag, so his sovereigns or his financial backers were the Catholic kings of Spain. And in particular, that was Queen Isabella of Castile and her husband, King Ferdinand of Aragon. Now, Queen Isabella was known to be a devout Catholic. And so when they were colonizing the Americas, you have to remember that they had just got through reconquering Spain, which had been um, occupied a large portion of it by the Muslims for several hundred years. So she was trying to unite her kingdom, even as it was expanding, and Christianize it. And so part of the plan when um, the Americas were colonized is that priests were brought along as well so they could baptize the Native Americans and any, anybody that they were uh, subjugating. And um, as a consequence, these priests kept meticulous records of baptisms, births, uh, burials, and deaths, and so forth in, in the missions and in the cathedrals. And so if you're thinking, well, how can I get to that information if I want to find it? Um, Fortunately, that's where you can thank the LDS Church because this is a church organization that made it part of its mission to digitize a lot of these documents. They have scanned these documents so that it's at your fingertips, really. And so I know that Mexico in particular has records that go back about 400 years or more. And so if you're Tejano, you're in a lot of luck because I can almost guarantee you that your family ancestry is noted on these documents. Now, if you're asked, how do I get a hold of these documents? That brings me to the second most valuable source of genealogical information, and that would be genealogical websites. Uh, most of you have probably heard of Ancestry.com. It's a very popular genealogical website, which does a lot of heavy advertising. I'm a member of it myself, and they have digitized literally millions of documents from around the world uh, that will tie your ancestor to a certain place and time period in a certain event. and. Um, we're not just talking about baptismal records or things like that. We're talking about military records, gravesite records, and so forth. <clears throat> also, these websites have communities of other genealogists that are looking for their family tree, and you may f connect with some that have similar branches of the tree, and you can reach out to these folks, and most of them have family trees that are public. Some of them are private. They just want to keep it private within the family, but those that are doing it publicly um, have a wealth of information and may have already got a lot of information for you without even trying. Just for subscribing, you, you might hit the jackpot, kind of. But I do uh, give a word of caution with that. Some of the newer genealogists are really cutting and pasting what somebody else has done. And I like to verify that the information that I'm putting in my history is actually corroborated with some kind of documentation. And if it is, then I, I know that's probably legit. There's also FamilySearch.org, which is actually um, uh, an LDS website. It, I remember signing up for free. I've never been charged anything for this, and I assume that it's free. So really, most of what Ancestry gets is from the LDS. And just incidentally, one of my second cousins, who's also a genealogist, he happens to be LDS, and I asked him, what is it about the LDS church that they're so interested in genealogy? And he replied in a nutshell, well, we believe that we can pray for our ancestry as a means of trying to get them to get to heaven. Someday. Well, that's pretty cool. But whatever the reason is, these folks have done a fabulous job of, of putting these uh, documents at your fingertips. Now I want to show you a page that there's some samples here of different documents that you will find about your ancestry. Uh, a couple of these are, one is from the cathedral in Mexico, uh, pardon me, Monterey, Nuevo Leon, Mexico. Uh, the next one over is a, a birth certificate from Star County, Texas from one of my great uncles. Uh, there's, I think it's either a birth or death certificate, I can't remember which up there. Um, th that's a Texas document. Uh, the one below that is a civil document from Mexico, and what you see at the far left is a, a U.S. census up on top, <clears throat> and down below there is a military a draft record, both front and back. 
So if you're Tejano, it, it's, it helps if you have a little bit of Spanish background because obviously these documents were written in Spanish and in some cases, uh, old Latin. And so, but even if you're not an expert in Spanish, like, like I really am not an expert, uh, that's what apps are for, you know, translation apps like Spanish to English, English to Spanish, uh, or just a good old, you know, old fashioned book, the old Spanish English dictionary. And I've used that many times to decipher what's in there. So I just wanna show you that, you know, what you're looking at at your fingertips. And these, remember these archives, like the one I'm at the far uh, left, that's my eighth great grandfather's um, burial records in the Cathedral of Monterey in Nuevo Leon, Mexico. Now I wanna show you at least one page to give you an idea of just how intuitive and easy it is uh, on these websites to use them. And so um, what you see here is a pedigree chart. And when you first subscribe to these websites, there's gonna be a box where you enter your name, your date of birth, where you were born, et cetera. And then two other boxes will pop up to describe your parents, where they were born. And so for same information, as far as you can go to your grandparents. And you'll notice that as you're doing this, Ancestry's search engine and, and, and family search as well, they're already trying to find documents that may be tied to your ancestry. And what you'll see is a little icon, that little green icon there is actually a picture of a leaf, and it's telling you, we have hints for you that we may have documents that are related to this uh, relative that you're looking for. So, we're, we're gonna use my great-grandfather Juan Jose Saldana's um, box there as an illustration where the arrow is pointing. If you pop or you click that icon, it'll pop up a little larger, and then you'll notice that the leaf has a two next to it, which indicates there's two hints that ancestry have. It could be two family trees or it could be actual documents, but it's telling you we have information that we think may be related to this individual that you're researching. So if you click that, you, what you'll get is a, a full page, which is seen up in the upper left-hand corner. Um, that is Juan's file, if you will, in Ancestry. And off to the side here is some of his family information. Now, that information I already had, but over here is the first hint. And there's another one down here. You'd have to scroll down. But if you click that icon again, you get what's over to the bottom right. And it's a pop-up window. And that window indicates that, well, this is a record from uh, the church, the Catholic church in Mier, Tamaulipas, Mexico. That's a little town across the border of, in the state of Tamaulipas uh, in Mexico. And if you click that, what you see next is the actual document. And so it pops up and I wanna point something out. In these documents, there are some tools that you can use on the side to either enlarge the, uh, the, the uh, document there or change the contrast if it's kinda of hard to see. Remember, some of these documents are 400 years old. They're falling apart. They try to capture them well before they're gone. And so you can change the contrast from uh, white letters on, on uh, black letters on white background or vice versa to see if that helps you decipher. But again, we're using my great great grandfather Juan's um, example here. And so if you notice at the top, there's a, a row with headings that, that pertain to these different columns. We're gonna zoom in on that. So here's the top of the, the column on the, on the left-hand page. And up at the top it says, numero, uh, fecha, bautizos, edad, padres, su domicilio, which in English interprets as entry number, date, uh, name of the baptized, age, uh, parents, and hometown. And if we look for Juan, because they said, well, he's on here somewhere, so you gotta look for him. I've, he's found a little bit further down the page, and apparently he's entry number 2,547. He was uh, baptized on March the 8th of 1821. That's 200 years ago. Um, and his parents are off to the side. That was Jose Reyes Saldana and Maria Antonia Flores. And uh, they were uh, citizens of the city of Mier. And this brought up a nugget for me that I never knew until I looked up this document. And surprisingly, where Juan is noted there, uh, I discovered that he was apparently a twin. He had a twin sister named San Juana uh, Saldana, and they were baptized together. So this is the kind of thing you'll discover that you may not know. So if, when and if I get to this side of the family history and write it, that's just kind of a neat nugget to share with people. Maybe some of their twin descendants will appreciate that. Now, this brings me up to the third valuable source of genealogy, and I would say that that's social media. Social media has kind of revolutionized the way we communicate, and it can be good or bad, folks, but for genealogists, it's real good. And this is a way to find some of your long-lost cousins, um, 
by just searching their names and seeing if some of the information that they've posted jives with some of your information. Um, and if it's, they can have a private page or they can have a public page, but if it's public, that indicates that you're welcome to look at it as far as I'm concerned. And I have actually found cousins this way. And you've heard stories about people that found their biological parents or uh, biological siblings that maybe they were adopted and they were able to relocate these folks or find these folks without even the help of a, a private investigator. So again, there's a lot of people on social media and that's a great way to connect with cousins. And you'll also find that people love to post pictures of their family. I know I do, you know, I'm proud of my family and, and I've posted pictures of my great, great grandparents and, and hopefully other cousins that might be interested, they're welcome to it. That's, to me, that's what it's for. Um, so it's a great way to connect. And also there are groups on these sites, genealogical groups, if you will, uh, really for just about anything. If you're into, you know, uh, building model planes, there's probably a group for that. If you're a genealogist, there are groups for that. And so um, it's a great source to get information on your family. And then lastly, I wanna mention, since we're talking about Tejanos in particular, there are four major genealogical sites, or societies, pardon me, uh, in the state of Texas. The first one here to the left is the Tejano Genealogy Society of Austin. I had the privilege of speaking to them in July. It's a great group of people, and they're um, very helpful with people that are looking for their ancestry in the Tejano genre there, or, uh, culture. And the second one is the Via San Agustin de Laredo Genealogical Society in Laredo, Texas. I'll be speaking with them uh, next October. In October, they're having a statewide Hispanic genealogical uh, convention down there, and they asked me to go talk. And I said I'd be happy to. Then you have the uh, Hispanic Genealogical Society of Houston. That's a pretty big society as well. And finally, you have OGAD right here in Dallas, and OGAD stands for Hispanic. I got to read it here. Hispanic origin, what I like about, it's an acronym. What I like about that acronym is OGAD stands for home. That's Spanish for home. And anytime you're looking for family or you're in the presence of family, I feel like you're at home, even if they're people you've, you've never known from the past. So it's a really neat uh, acronym that they have there. And all of these societies are available if you're interested in learning more about your Tejano history or Hispanic history. And they have periodic meetings, uh, they have guest speakers like myself uh, now and then. And they also promote projects that uh, promote Hispanic history and ancestry. I know that the Tejano Genealogy Society of Austin in particular was very instrumental in putting together the Tejano Monument in Austin on the Capitol grounds. Now, if you've never been to the Capitol, in and of itself, it's a great place to visit. It's very historical. If you're Tejano in particular, you might appreciate the wonderful monument that was put up there, I think within the last 15, 20 years. It really hasn't been that long. And in my opinion, it was long overdue, but I'm just happy it's there, and it's there for us to learn about their contribution to Texas as we know it today. So we'll talk a little bit about that second ingredient. We finally got to the second ingredient, and that has to do with the history of the region uh, that your ancestries lived in and the period or the time period in which they lived in. And again, if you can at least figure what was going on around the time period with your ancestors, you got a pretty good idea of what they were probably thinking, whether it was culturally, socially, politically, whatever was going on, you might have a decent idea of, of what they were going through. And um, so it, it, I found out myself when I started getting into this that um, there's a lot of history in South Texas. Now I'm from the heart of South Texas, a little town called Alice. It was named after Richard King, of the King Ranch's daughter. And it's right smack dab in the middle of South Texas. and. Um, you know, it wasn't until I was in college that I came, became aware that even though I'm from deep South Texas and grew up there and have a lot of ancestry there, I don't really remember learning a whole lot about South Texas per se. Um, and so that intrigued me because when I was in undergraduate <clears throat> school, by default I had to take many science courses uh, because I wanted to be a health professional. And so I had to take those courses if I wanted to get to where I was going. And having said that, every now and then we'd still have to take core classes like Western Civilization. And so many students might have found that boring. I found it very interesting and refreshing because I'm learning about humanity, how it evolved over time, what uh, uh, societies were built, and uh, what was the path to how I got to where I am today. So it's a part, humanity is a part of all of our history. So to me, it's very interesting. One class I took in particular when I finally had a chance to take an elective was the history of Mexico. And this was taught by an Anglo professor by the name of Del Moras. Now this guy was essentially a uh, Latin American study expert. 
And I was impressed by the fact that this guy knows more about my cultural experience in North America from way back when than even I do. And that kind of sparked my interest to learn more about it on my own. And when I did that, I, I um, uh, learned that there's more to Texas than the Alamo. Alamo is a huge, pivotal part of American history, Texan history. There's no doubt about it. But there was a lot of history that led up to it and a lot of history subsequent to that. And if you're Tejano, I'm telling you right now, your, your ancestors lived through all of it. And so that's what makes me interested to know more about history. And as I did this, I learned more about, uh, say, the Lipan Apaches or Coahuiltacan Indians, uh, you know, about the Spanish explorers, the, the Tejanos, the Vaqueros, who really are the forefather of the mythical American cowboy. I'll tell you right now, it all started in South Texas, where I'm from, from the Vaqueros. Uh, and uh, Texas Rangers, there's all kinds of stories about interesting characters that lived in South Texas. This slide shows some of the people that have meandered or in South Texas, because I'm from there. But you have explorers like Cabeza de Baca uh, went through there. He's a famous Spanish explorer. Uh, you know, Robert LaSalle was a French explorer who actually sailed up the Rio Grande River. I'd never learned that in school. I'm not, maybe I wasn't paying attention, but if, if there's any teachers out there. But uh, also some of our US presidents like Grant and uh, you know, um, Taylor, they had dealings down there where, they was, where it was the US-Mexican War, whatever was going on. These guys were down there. And what I'm trying to say is that our Tejano ancestry lived through all of these uh, historical figures' dealings in South Texas. They changed the course of history and they're there as a part of it, adapting or otherwise, but they were there. Now, if you want to learn about Tejano history from a Tejano perspective, I would recommend three books here. One of them is called Tejano Empire by Dr. Andres Tijerina, and he is a professor in one of the colleges down in Austin. And this is a book that talks about the daily life of Tejanos as they moved into Texas across the border, really on both sides of the border as they settled, how they put up their ranches, how they fed their life or, or watered their livestock. Because if you've ever been to South Texas or if you've never been to South Texas, it's a very semi-arid place. There's really, you know, we, we're next to the Gulf, but a lot of it is really harsh country to, to, to even raise livestock. Uh, it talks about how, what their uh, cultural uh, traditions were, what kind of foods they ate and so forth. And I don't know if there's a list of required reading books in the state of Texas for high school uh, students, but if there is, I think this one should be on there because without that you don't really have a true picture of what was happening in Texas prior to it becoming Texas, uh, which was also known as Texas or Coahuila, which was one state from the Spanish Empire, part of New Spain. The next book is called Tejano Legacy, and that's by Armando C. Alonso. Now that's a book that talks about Tejanos and their uh, enterprises as cattlemen um, and livestockers, um, how they dealt with uh, different trends of, you know, um, um, in selling their product and, and getting it shipped off and things like the cattle drives, like the Chisholm Trail. You know, you heard of that one, right? Um, and how they interacted with the Anglo settlers that were coming in from the United States from the East. Those guys were mainly farmers. And if you know anything about farming and ranching, you can't have farmland and ranching on the same spot. It's not gonna work out. So they had to figure out how to deal with these uh, different changes that they were going through. The other book is called Anglos and Mexicans in the Making of Texas. And this is a pretty straightforward book that talks about the hardships and the struggles that the Anglos and the Mexican cultures as they clash to vie for uh, land holdings in Texas. It happens throughout history, folks, but it's good to know this. It wasn't always pretty history, but it is history, and it's a part of who we are and how we got here, how we ended up staying here. And uh, to me, that book really opened my eyes to, to realize that um, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants with my ancestry, and I'm really blessed to be here where I am today compared to what they went through. And that goes for both cultures. They went through hardships as well. And the last um, photo you see there is from a self-publication called El Mesteño, which means the Mustang. And that's a self-publication that was put out by a gentleman named Omera Vera, Omero Vera, excuse me. And he's from Jim Wells County, which is the county I was born in. He's got a ranch land in Duval County. And this is a guy that took upon himself to self-publish something that talked about South Texas history. Uh, uh, whether it was the settlers with uh, Spanish land grants or Tejano ranchers or vaqueros that had old stories that they could tell, um, recipes and all that. So he just wanted to let people know, hey, we've been here. We we've always been here. You should Somebody please take notice. And he did a wonderful job, really, of doing this on his own. So I had to mention him. Now, there's also other valuable resources like online. 
you know, the, the um, information highway can also be good or bad, but for genealogists, it's great because there's a lot of information there about history at your fingertips, um, you know, and um, at, the, at the click of a button, you can Google search any topic about any history and within seconds, you have a story that reflects. And I used Wikipedia quite a bit when I put my book together because it was just so convenient. I do have many books about South Texas history, but I, you know, I'd be lying if I didn't say I didn't use Wikipedia because it was very handy and, and um, you know, there and, and, uh, in within seconds. Uh, there's also the tshaonline.org website that's put on by the Texas State Historical Association. And that's a great website for Texas history in particular. So if you're from Indiana and you want to do your research, maybe you want to do a research, maybe they have a historical association, but if you're interested in Texas history, this is the one you want to check, believe me. Um, there's online blogs uh, and, and publications. Are and then there's YouTube. YouTube is a very wonderful way to learn about history. I know my wife was trying to get certification in history one time and she learned most of her stuff from professors that were just putting it out for free on YouTube. And if you're a visual learner, a lot of times they have maps and pictures of, of famous people or regions that you can learn that way. And again, it's free. And don't forget your local library, you guys. Don't forget Allen Public Library. It's a great library here. Uh, the picture you see down there at the bottom is my local library uh, when I grew up as a kid in Alice. And I'll never forget the first time. I, I still remember checking out my first book. I think it was Where the Wild Things Are by uh, Maurice Sendek. And that kind of gave me the bug for reading. Now, I didn't do a lot of reading in high school because I was too busy goofing off. But subsequent to that in college, whenever I had time to read, I loved to read. And so libraries are some of my favorite places because it's just, it's just a wealth of knowledge and learning. So if you think that learning about your Tejano family ancestry is an insurmountable task, think again. That's not really true because there's a lot of information out there for you um, and it's not hard to get to. And even though you might run into some obstacles now and then, uh, it's not impossible to do this. And like I've told many people, if I can do this, you can do it. Uh, matter of fact, my topic in, at the, in, in Laredo is going to be self-publishing a, a book. If I can do it, you can do it. I'm not an author. I, literally, I'm not, I've never done this before. But if you set your mind to anything, you know, and you're determined enough, you can get something like this done. And it's a very interesting thing to a uh, uh, hobby to have. So if you decide to go for it and you want to learn about your uh, genealogy and Tejano history, um, just know that it's interesting. It's relevant. Uh, it's a rewarding experience, and it's your own history. I've always said that history is interesting, but it's even more interesting if it's your own history. Who doesn't want to know about their own past? Uh, it's enjoyable, and it'll be appreciated if, if not just your immediate family members, uh, your own descendants, maybe someone you'll never meet down the line will look back and say, boy, I'm so glad that Uncle Robert wrote this book or whatever so that I, had, I, I can have access to this information. Now, I was asked by Mr. Keener if I could share with you an example of some of my ancestry, and that's what I'm gonna do next. Um, this gentleman is in my book, uh, part of the book, and his name is Felipe Olivares. He was one of my maternal great-great-grandfathers. Felipe was born in Rancho de la Bonita, which in English translates to Ranch of the Pretty One, as was his wife, Mika, I'm sorry, Nicolasa Peña, that was my great-great-grandmother. They were both born on that ranch and they got married in 1865. Um, what's interesting about some of their ancestry is that Felipe, as I, uh, one of our direct uh, dis, um, ancestors is General Juan de Olivares. He's the guy that's in that record I showed you from the cathedral in Monterey. And he was a, a general in the Spanish army during the uh, colonization of the Americas. And one of his sons was Bartolomé de Olivares, which is who we, who we are both descended from. But one of Bartolomé's siblings was Beatriz de Olivares. Well, Beatriz was married to a guy named Juan Bautista Chapa. Well, what's the big deal about him? This was an Italian guy that sailed to, the, uh, to New Spain from, from Italy at a very early age and changed his name to Chapa. But this guy ended up, wound up being an assistant to four different governors, governors in Mexico during the, the colonization of the Americas by the Spaniards. And one of those governors was Alonso de Leon, and he accompanied him on expeditions into Texas when they were trying to figure out what was up here. They owned the land, but it wasn't very well established at that point. And so they did expeditions and kept track of the, the flora, the fauna, the rivers, the Native Americans they ran into, and so forth. And so he's credited for having written the very first history of South and West Texas. And the original manuscript for his writings are found at the Meineke Library at Yale University. And it has been since translated into English 
and the title is Texas and Northeastern Mexico, 1630 to 1690. So it's kind of cool when you can find someone in your family that's kind of, they did something major in history. And, and even though it's a couple of degrees of separation, she was my maternal eighth uh, great aunt. At any rate, uh, and as far as Nicolasa, she was descended from my sixth great grandfather, Jeronimo Sainz, who was one of the original uh, Spanish land grant grantees north of the Rio Grande River. Because Spain was giving grants out uh, both north and south of the river. So as we know it today, um, they were on the north side. So we all know that the Rio Bravo or the Rio Grande River is an international boundary, but back then it was just a river. Because when it was Texas and Coahuila, it was just one big region. Now they had a family, they had six children, and I was descended from Isidora, who was their second oldest. And this is a picture, great pictures of her siblings and herself. From left to right, in chronological order, from older to younger, is Matias, Isidora, Librado, Nazaria, Petra, and Victoria Olivares. And they were also all born at Rancho de la Bonita, just south of the border in, in, at that ranch. And one thing I failed to mention was Rancho de, de la Bonita no longer exists because at some point the government in Mexico uh, dammed up one of the rivers so they could have better irrigation for their farmers. And in the process, this ranch unfortunately was inundated. So it's there, but it's way underwater. So. Not too long after the, all these children were born, uh, Nicolasa's, uh, Nicolasa, my great-great-grandmother, passed away. And when that happened, Felipe took his children and he, and he moved up north of the river and he settled down and started a ranch called Rancho Alta Colorada, which means High Red Ranch. And he settled this ranch, or he started this ranch in the land grant known as Santa Teresa Land Grant, or St. Teresa. That particular land grant, um, the original grantee was Gregorio Vela, and he's an ancestor of Petra Vela. Well, who's Petra Vela? Petra Vela's a pretty big wig in South Texas because she was from a well-to-do Spanish family, and she ended up marrying Mifflin Kennedy, who was a huge cattle baron, along with Richard King. In fact, they were business associates, so there's a museum in their honor down there. I think it's Sarita, Texas, next to Kingsville. And he remarried after he moved to Texas, that is Felipe did. His second wife's name was Marcela Gonzalez, and that's a great picture of him with Marcela and their children. Um, she was actually a second cousin to his first wife, Nicolasa. I would have hated to have been at those Thanksgiving dinners, can you imagine? But at any rate, they were related, and the, she was also a descendant of Jeronimo Sainz, my sixth great-great-grandfather, who was a land grantee down there. And the names of their children were Ramon, Librado, Natividad, Rosa, and Evarista Olivares. And by the way, they went from De Olivares, which is the name they carried in Spain, back there, that particular lineage back to 1500s. And when they crossed into Texas, they dropped the De, and it, from then on, it was only Olivares. Here's a great picture of uh, Felipe sitting in front of his ranch house at Alta Colorado. Uh, his wife, Nick, um, Marcella, is just behind him, and these are some of his great, uh, older uh, grandkids and kids. That's a, cow, a house known as a Casa de Ciar, which is made out of caliche rock or limestone. That building is still up, it's amazing, but it's still up there in Stark County. And by the way, this, is, this ranch is in the little town called San Isidro, I don't think I mentioned that, San Isidro, or St. Isidore, who was a patron saint of farming back in Spain. And anyways, on a couple of occasions, I went out there to visit and I took pictures. These are about five years apart over to the right-hand side there. Uh, but it's amazing that the, the, the building is still, in spite of hurricanes and everything, it's still up. Um, and in the bottom picture, you can see a little dirt road here that goes to the back. Well, just back there, maybe 30, 40 yards, is the family Campo Santo, which was the family uh, cemetery. And here's a picture, it's a couple pictures there. That's a picture of my daughter when she was much younger. Uh, we went out there uh, uh, looking for our roots, and she took a picture by his gravesite. So his bones are out there still in deep South Texas. This is a great picture, and um, any teachers in the crowd will appreciate this, but this is the school ranch house that he put up for his children and his grandchildren. He was in the United States now. He may have been born in Mexico or under Spanish rule or whatever his ancestry was, but he was in the U.S. now, so he had to know English. And at the very least, it's impressive to me that he wanted his children to learn English so that they could assimilate into the, the American society. And um, most of the kids up there are either his uh, kids or grandkids. These are to me, obviously Anglo professors, okay? And I have not identified this little girl, but I, I believe that's their daughter, because she's, she's blonde, she sticks out. And um, 
It's possible that they were hired from McAllen, which isn't too far away, but it would have been quite a, kind of a long buggy ride, or they may have lived on the ranch. But at any rate, it's impressive to me that he hired these folks so that he could get his offspring to start learning English and, in addition to math and reading and all of that. And off to the left-hand side is a page from my book where my daughter helped me put together a silhouette figure to identify most of those people in the picture. This is a Spanish water well that is still intact uh, on, his, on what was Felipe's property. Now this thing predates him because when um, grantees were asking for uh, land from the king of Spain, they had to prove that they could uh, water their cattle. And most of, a lot of the grants were elongated grants that were above and below the Rio Grande River so, so that they could um, water their cattle. But a lot of folks had lands that was further inland. So these guys had to dig up well. So that probably date, predates in the you know, 17th century or whatever. And it's still up. And the guy that owns it now is one of uh, my great-great-grandfather's uh, descendants, Raul Villarreal Jr., who's a distant half-cousin of mine because he's from the second wife's family and I'm from the first wife's family. And it caught the attention of the Museum of South Texas History in Edinburgh and um, they did a little video on it called Spanish Water Well in San Isidro, Texas. And it's just a five to 10 minute video, but it's kind of neat to commemorate the history that you know, um, has been there for so long. This is the last picture I have of Felipe. He's sitting in the middle here uh, with his hat. That's my great grandmother and her son, Celestino, which was her youngest son. And he's the guy that my book is actually centered around, his maternal and paternal family. And these are some of his siblings. Um, there's a couple more of Felipe's daughters, like these uh, ladies right here. And then again, uh, some of his kids who were younger, that grew up with their half siblings who were older now. And it's a, if a picture's worth a thousand words, this one's worth 10,000 words to me because the guy's just beaming with pride. Oh, I sired this huge family here and we made it, we've, we've survived. And just about every one of his descendants that stayed here, or his family I should say, they uh, ended up staying in Texas, whereas some of Felipe's siblings back in Mexico stayed in Mexico. And that picture was taken about 1905. So as you can see, the heritage uh, that Tejanos have is, is a rich heritage, it's a colorful heritage, and it's an interesting heritage. And um, you know, until we see any textbooks about it, there's nothing keeping us from writing our own history and telling stories. And I think everyone that's into genealogy should, should do that. Uh, because again, it's a, it's a great heirloom for the family. They may really appreciate that down the road. And so, um, you know, just remember that as we, as we um, uh, think about Texas history, there's many immigrants that came to Texas, but the interesting thing about Tejanos for me is that they were here from the get-go, and I don't think that should be uh, forgotten. So, in closing here, I just wanna let you know that if you're interested in this book, it's a self-published book, and it's available on Amazon. It recently won some recognition uh, or some accolades from two different um, uh, um, um, organizations. The first one is the Next Generation Indie Book Award. It was a finalist for them this year, and also it re most recently got an International Latino Book Award, um, and um, I'm gonna be going to receive that medal in Los Angeles next month sometime. So this is not to be braggadocious. This is just to make the point that somebody found this interesting outside of the family. And to me, if not for the history, genealogy without a history is not as interesting. And so, it's, again, if this inspires you to put your own family history together in this manner, by all means, go, go ahead and do it, because I think there's a, a need for it, and, there's, and people appreciate it. And lastly, of course, I just want to give a big uh, thank you to Mr. Tom Keener for inviting me to be here in the Allen Public Library and doing a little research about the library. I found that they won an Achievement of Excellence Award recently, and that's, that says a lot about this institution here. And, um, you know, just like I said, if you get a chance to visit this library, don't hesitate, bring the kids. There's a lot to learn here, a lot of wealth of information for you to, to uh, learn about here. And so with that, I'm gonna bid you all good night and thanks for coming out. I appreciate you being here and anybody that's listening online, it's been a real pleasure to be with you tonight. Thank you so much. I'm sorry, I forgot there would be a question. Any questions out there? Surely you have one. Anytime you have a teacher, you're gonna have a question. There is so much history from like the 1820s all the way through, you know, current time. But mm -hmm. like, because you've had a chance to dive in and see, for example, the, the ancestry, of, especially in deep South Texas, mm -hmm. like a, you saw, like Count Escondon was, for example, mentioned right, the right, founder right. of Laredo. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, but like uh, when you were discovering, did you, besides just, you know, knowing the family tree 
And did you see any evidence, for example, of maybe involvement in like the Texas Revolution, the Mexican-American War, Pancho Villa? I mean, there, there, there's, a, there's a lot of different things that have occurred around the border and wondered if, if you had a discovery on that. Okay, well, on, on some of my father's side of the family, there are in fact um, members that participated in the Re Mexican Revolution, but I don't know if they were on Villa side or the Federalist side, to be honest with you. But one was a border guard down there, and he was actually hung because, as you know, back then, horse thieving went both ways. The Mexicans were stealing the Texas cattle, and Texas uh, bandits were stealing Mexican cattle, going back and forth. So he was a border guard, and uh, uh, he lost his life doing that. So there's, there's that. Um, and as far as, um, you know, uh, the Texas Revolution, I know this, that part of my God is side of the family. They didn't participate in that, but some of them are buried in Goliad in the same cemetery where a lot of the... Uh, or, you know, the Goliad massacre and all that took place. So even though they, they didn't participate in any of that, um, I mean, they're tied to it by default just because they're buried out there. And so, you know, you learn things like that that you want to put together to make it interesting and tie it together. Yep. Sure. I'm going to ask a question that's kind of esoteric, but, you know, most people start out wanting to get the dates and the facts, and that's important. But then they find out that what they're learning is a story. And then that story transforms them as a person. Did you experience that? I did. You know, I mentioned earlier um, how ancestry, for example, can give you a sense of what your cultural mix, because they do DNA testing. And um, I came to find out that I'm maybe 30, 30-ish percent Native American, 60-ish percent Spaniard, and then there's a whole mix of other things in there. Um, and it gives you a better sense of, of who, not only who you are, but how you got here. And in learning the history, I've learned a lot of other things as well. For example, um, as far as recorded history goes, I don't know of any utopia that has ever existed. The United States of America is about as close as it's gotten. And so for me personally, um, while I respect and, and appreciate the, the harsh history of the past on how civilizations came to be, um, I have a better sense of like just being grateful that I wasn't living at that time, you know, because it was kind of hard. And um, I've had, um, you know, people ask, well, didn't, uh, didn't the Anglos take the, the, the land from the Tejanos? And, that, you know, to some degree, maybe so. But I'll turn around and ask, well, if you know your history, our ancestry took land from people too, okay? And not only that, if you're Native American, with all due respect to my Native American friends, after all, I'm a third Native American, I know from learning from history, in fact, I took a class in Native American history one time as an elective, uh, they've always been at war with each other, and that's not taking anything from the majesty of, of, of uh, that culture, all of them in general. Uh, but at the end of the day, the more you delve into history on your own by researchers and historians who have gone beyond whatever's in a textbook, like bullet points, the more you're gonna discover, we actually have more in common than we have not in common as, as, a, as human beings. And that's something that's been um, special for me. That's a beautiful answer. Uh, in fact, it should go down in one of the great quotes of, on YouTube when we put it on. <laughs> um, one of the things that impressed me was the fact that y'all had so many photos uh, of way back. Uh, now, that most people don't have photos past granddad mm -hmm. so that was very impressive mm -hmm. and secondly there seems to be a sense um, that your family emphasized education from way back mm -hmm. and that, that they would hire teachers to come out to the ranch to teach the kids it was impressive do we know who those teachers were <laughs> As far as the photos, I do not know who they, were. they are. I wish someone would recognize them and, and come forward and recognize them because that's a pretty neat picture. You know, for, it's, a, it's a beautiful picture with both cultures uh, helping each other out. Okay. Do you understand what I'm saying in, in Texas? And as we know, I mean, I just found this statistic the other day. I think it's official that the state of Texas now has, it's just tipped over. There's more Hispanics than there are uh, Anglo. They're not necessarily all Tejano, but the point is, um, um, you know, we live together, we're integrated, and there's a lot more mixed marriages these days and all that, and I have many cousins that are Anglo. And so, um, so as far as um, who those people are, unfortunately, I'm not sure who they were, but what I've learned with the photos in general 
is that the, like the first pictures you saw of my great great grandfather and his wife, my great great grandmother, those were tin type photos. And I learned this through learning about history. Tin type photos were a big thing in like 1860s, 1870s. And they were taken, that was the, the, what is it, the Polaroid that you could snap in and come out? That was the Polaroid of their time. And uh, photographers would make rounds at ranches or different events and charge money to take pictures. And so I'm quite sure that those pictures were taken by some, a, either a traveling photographer or whatever, because it was on their ranch. And that's how they did it back then, you know, and um, as, that's my knowledge of it. But as, as many of those photos were passed down from generation to generation, you know, through my mother's side of the family. And that's why we still have the original photos. I, one of my cousins has it. They belong to one of my aunts. That and so, is wonderful. Yep. My grandmother, the first few years she taught, this is around 1915, 20, 1910, she was hired by ranches. And uh, it was very common for her to have the children of the vaqueros and the the ranch foremans and they they would all come to a room and learn their ABCs and how to count and that's what she did the first couple of years and it was pretty rugged because she told me that there was a well and outhouse and and isolated but uh, the children would come in from all over the countryside and these ranchers would pay her you know maybe a dollar a day to teach these kids and that's that's pretty neat. Yeah, it, it's interesting. Um, you know, what I try to teach or, or uh, share with my Tejano friends is that what the Anglos were doing westward, the, the Spanish or Hispanics were doing northward. And at, at some point there was going to be a merging. I mean, it just had to happen, right? And um, But, you know, the Southwest to me is the most beautiful part of the United States. Uh, because it's such a rich history. And I'm not taking anything else from anybody else, but I'm from the Southwest. Maybe that's why I'm partial to it. But it's just fascinating how these societies merged and um, came together. And like I said, um, when you learn history and add that to your own family's ancestry, uh, you'll know a lot more about where you came from and why you're here and why you're still here. And so it's, it's a very enlightening experience. And, I, and that's why I call it Tejano experience. I wanted to share with others, this is what your similar ancestors probably went through. So anyway, I would encourage anyone to learn about their own history, though, like I said before, any cultural mix you're from, it's a beautiful thing to learn about your history. Any other last minute questions, comments, protests? Dr. Robert Saldana, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night. It was great to be here. Thank you.